Well, good morning uh, and welcome to the uh, September 2023 update to the Spears and Associates Drilling and Production Outlook forecast. So um, over the next 60 minutes, um, I want to take the opportunity to present the highlights from our, um, our, our revised forecast and uh, take any questions. So um, we have a feature that allows folks uh, who have questions to type those in and uh, I'll get to them at the uh, end of my talk here. Um, but like I said, um, we're focused on, we've, we've done some revisions to the report um, and understanding that uh, in many ways, uh, 2023 is pretty much in the books and everybody's focus is increasingly turning to 2024. So that's what we want to talk about today, sort of how we see things are uh, setting, getting set up for uh, next year um, and look at what that means for activity both here in uh, the U.S. and North America as well as around the world. So if you're familiar with the process, and I'm sure many of you are, um, we'll go ahead and uh, get started. So give us a second. We'll transition over so we've got some slides in front of you. Uh, update and these remarks are being recorded on September 1st so for anybody who's looking at this um, after that date and wondering uh, where was it that we were coming up with these numbers um, we were doing the work and putting these uh, 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 report together and the numbers together in late August and uh, so that reflects our knowledge of, of events at the time and uh, estimates of where that all might lead. Um, as usual, we get started looking at uh, what's happening on a global basis in terms of oil supply and demand. And so uh, here's our chart that tracks uh, those numbers uh, going back to the start of 2021, coming out of the pandemic, and then going through the end of 2024. Now, the forecast you see in front of you is from the uh, U.S. Energy Information Agency. And so um, I put that together. Uh, it's interesting because uh, if you follow the news um, these days, um, each day it seems like there's a story that talks about um, where is global oil demand going. Um, they, they sort of take turns. One day it will be about how strong the U.S. Uh, economy is and um, what that likely means in terms of increased demand for uh, energy use and oil demand here in the U.S. And then the next day, there'll be a story about worries about China and the fact that its economy is not recovering as fast as folks had initially expected and the problems that, that then a slower than expected growth out of China might mean in terms of um, oil demand. So um, we can talk about each of those in, in particular, but I think it's useful to uh, put it in context of what on a global basis um, we're, uh, we're looking at. So, um, and still on a global basis, as uh, is um, shown by the, uh, the blue demand line on the chart, uh, expectations are that uh, consumption is uh, going to continue to grow. Um, and those demand forecast numbers have been remarkably steady over the course of this year uh, in terms of both demand for 2023 and 2024. So uh, 101 million barrels a day uh, or so of uh, consumption um, in 2023, uh, up just under 2%. And then next year's number is almost 103 million barrels a day, uh, up about one and a half, 1 1.6%. So um, consensus forecast is that on a global basis, we continue to see uh, oil demand growing at pretty much its historic rate over the past decade plus now. Uh, global oil consumption has been growing at about one and a half points uh, per year. So that trend looks to be in place, although it's really interesting when you then begin to sort of break it down into, into its component parts. And of course, China gets a lot of the attention um, these days because in the past, with its economy growing 8-10% per year, uh, it was routinely turning in uh, oil demand growth numbers uh, in that same range, 8-10% per year. Well. Uh, Chinese economy has um, has got uh, all kinds of problems. The real estate sector, uh, well published, um, its export led economy is struggling, and so forth. And um, so, consumption in China this year is around 16 million barrels a day, uh, putting it number two in terms of uh, global oil consumption. Um, and next year's number is 16.4 million barrels a day. So that represents only a two and a half percent growth. 
in um, Chinese demand, which uh, looks pretty low uh, relative to the history that they've turned in in years past in terms of percentage growth anyway. Although it is interesting to note, I mean, we're looking at a global oil consumption that in this forecast is assumed to go up 1.6 million barrels a day from 23 to 24. And the Chinese number is supposed to go up um, 0.4 million barrels a day, so account for 25% of the net increase in global oil consumption. So um, it, that's understandable then why, um, why there's so much focus on and concern about where the Chinese demand numbers might be going, because it's, um, it's, it's an important part of, uh, of the story as to how much growth might be expected next year. Now the problem that um, the problem that um, this kind of analysis was going to face going forward is that we're beginning to see both in Russia and in China um, some loss of information uh, allowing uh, folks to um, to gauge where the market's going. In Russia, um, they've really stopped releasing information in terms of uh, Russian oil production. So, um, and, and Russian oil production being uh, somewhere around 12 million barrels a day, so about 12% of the global number um, is an important piece, and we're, uh, we've just lost direct uh, access to that uh, here in the last few months. Uh, on its uh, part, China has, um, is beginning to restrict information around its uh, inventory levels. So uh, there's still information around um, demand and supply in, in China, but the inventory piece is beginning to uh, fade away from us. And so we just don't know what's coming in and out of storage in, um, in China, uh, or at least that will be the case uh, going forward. And so it's going to be in, in just added to the difficulty of trying to gauge where demand and supply stands on a global basis um, is, is going to be something that uh, it becomes tougher for us to deal with. And we, I think that means that we might see rumors in the market and uh, revisions to estimates uh, causing um, at least short-term swings in pricing um, as, uh, as, as those kind of things work their way through the system. Now, it's pretty clear that the market has grown tighter here in the second half of 2023. Um, you know, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia unilaterally announced back in July that it was going to take a million barrels of oil exports out of the market for the month of August, and then it later decided it would do the same in September. And the expectations is, or the expectations are, that it will do the same in um, October. So, um, with those barrels not being supplied to the market, um, the, the red supply line has clearly dipped below the blue demand line here in the second half of 2023. And as we all know, the price of oil has rallied from the high 60s to the low 80s in response to that. So. Um, so clearly, uh, Saudi is looking at concerns around demand growth and, um, and playing its classic card, which is to try and control what global oil inventories are so as to support prices and get them to an acceptable level. You know, one of the things we talk about in, in pricing, I get asked this question all the time, is what are break-even prices in various basins around the world? And you have a technical break-even price, right, which is um, associated with what's the cost of drilling and what what what's the number that that makes um, those expenditures uh, in the black from a rate of return basis. But there's also um, what's uh, called a fiscal break-even point, and that's often um, a more um, I would say uh, direct way of thinking about uh, oil pricing in, in uh, export-led nations, right? And so Saudi's a good example of that from a uh, fiscal break-even point, looking at it from a budgetary standpoint for the whole country. You know, they need a price that is in the high 80s or low 90s at this point in order to balance their, their budget. Um, from a technical break-even standpoint, yeah, they're at $20 a barrel maybe, but um, fiscally it's a, a much higher price. And so I think it's those kind of concerns which are directing Saudi actions at this point in the marketplace. And so... We expect that it'll be a fairly tight market then going forward throughout 2024, given all the caveats around uh, transparency of information. Um, the next slide looks at our estimate of crude oil production, which uh, from here from the U.S., which uh, these are our own numbers based on 
the drilling forecast that, uh, the, uh, that we now have, have made and our estimates of uh, well productivity and so forth. So um, we see U.S. crude production um, staying very flat for the next uh, six to uh, four to six quarters, as you can see on the chart, somewhere in the range of around 12.8 million barrels a day as being the uh, U.S. Uh, crude oil number. Um, uh, as you'll see in the forecast, we've got um, a decline in rig activity year to year, uh, which means fewer wells being fracked and put online. Um, and the other key piece to the assumption is that uh, we're assuming that um, new well productivity was basically going to uh, flatline over uh, the course of the forecast. So um, mind by this, what we're tracking is the productivity, first month productivity of new um, oil wells in shale or tight oil basins. Um, that number has been growing, uh, of course, over time as lateral lengths have gotten longer, as completion techniques have improved. Um, but when you look at it for the nation as a whole, given the data we have in hand at the moment anyway, um, uh, oil well productivity only rose 3% in 2022. And it looks to us that the numbers haven't grown this year. Now, there have been some notable exceptions to that. So um, I believe it was Pioneer and Occidental and uh, ConocoPhillips have each uh, talked about how their productivity numbers have improved in 2023 relative to 2022, um, and I'm sure that's the case. But I think for the industry as a whole, uh, the numbers are looking pretty flat. And, and so in knowing uh, this and knowing that one of the reasons that things have flattened out is because um, less and less of the acreage that's being developed is tier one, uh, the most prospective um, stuff in the inventory. Um, but it's gradually we're beginning to see more tier two and tier three kind of wells being drilled, which just would drag down the average productivity. Um, so our thought, though, going forward is that the productivity numbers would stay fairly flat. And the notion is that um, as productivity for an individual operator falls, as he moves into tier two or tier three stuff, that it probably doesn't become economic for them to drill. And so for those operators, they drill fewer and fewer wells over time. And so what's left being drilled are wells that do remain about as prospective as ones that are being drilled today. And so, um, so, the, so what's left stays fairly flat. Um, it's sort of like um, the analogy, I guess, would be uh, sort of thinking of basketball teams, right? When um, as you get better and better and better, you know, it seems like basketball players are, get taller and taller um, in you know, high school. The average player height might be 6'2", uh, in college it might be 6'4", in pros it might be 6'9", and it's not like, you know, the basketball players themselves are getting taller, but as you select fewer and fewer, you're left with um, taller and taller players, and, then, and that's, I think, going to be the case as we go into 2024, 25, 26, and on and on, is that the wells that will be drilled will, um, will remain um, uh, generally in the Tier 1 category, because the tier two and tier three stuff will just uh, not measure up when it comes to rate of return. And the operators with those properties just won't, won't be drilling those kind of wells. Um, the, then the discussion becomes, well, how much tier one acreage is out there or how much longer can you continue to drill that? And it seems to us, as we've talked about this and heard people uh, speak to the, that point, that uh, four or five years seems to be sort of the, uh, the, 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 the feeling that tier one acreage, uh, you know, that's how much inventory remains in hand at current rates of drilling. So I think after this, uh, that period of time, so once we get to 27, 28, 29, somewhere in there, then we may, be, may begin to see that well productivity curve begin to roll over and go back down. But for now, anyway, for these reasons, we're pretty comfortable assuming that productivity will be flat. Um, but I think it's a, a greater leap of faith to think it would continue to grow at this point. So, um, so all that put together, then we say uh, spot oil prices um, are going to um, average uh, $78 this year, uh, uh, $84 a barrel next year. Um, it's substantially above the break-even price in most U.S. basins. Most U.S. basins look at a break-even price at today's economics of somewhere in the mid-50 kind of range. Uh, 
uh, Permian Basin being, of course, uh, the lowest break-even price out there. So there's represents, though, even for all areas, um, a fairly substantial opportunity in terms of earning a, a decent rate of return on uh, on wells. Um, but again, it'll depend upon um, operators and how deep their pockets are um, and how aggressively they want to chase some of these opportunities, um, given uh, uh, issues around uh, capital availability um, to finance said programs. So, um, so, so we're mildly bullish in terms of spot oil prices. If you look at the future strip today, I think over the course of 2024, you will see that those numbers decline to around $75 a barrel. Um, I always um, tell folks that you know the future strip is a hedging device, not a uh, price uh, forecasting mechanism and it reflects the cost of uh, holding oil in inventory in order to be delivered in a future uh, uh, environment. So there's some uh, natural way uh, means in which the price degrades over time to sort of balance those increasing uh, storage costs. Um, so uh, so I, I'm pretty comfortable with the notion that a $75 future strip will, uh, will support um, a low, a low to mid 80s um, spot price uh, number going forward over the next uh, uh, six quarters. So we turn to the gas side here in the U.S. Uh, to take a peek at what's going on there. Um, you know, clearly it's hard to tell from this particular chart, but um, showing the quarterly uh, variation in U.S. natural gas consumption. Um, but, uh, but the year over year numbers would suggest again from the EIA that uh, gas consumption here in the U.S. will go up about a percent this year to uh, right around 89.4 billion cubic feet a day, BCFD, but then that it will fall uh, next year by uh, a point, uh, 1.7 percent. Um, I have to say that it's a common feature in all the EIA forecasts in recent years that whatever the next year is in the forecast will show uh, gas consumption declining. So uh, it's not uh, atypical for forecasts that the EIA puts out in, uh, around this time of year to show a, a one and a half to two percent decline in gas consumption, and it's usually based on the fact that they um, and, and in turn what happens usually is that gas consumption actually stays pretty flat from one year to the next, and maybe even grows. And it's usually because um, gas in the power sector performs better than the EIA assumes it will. So. Uh, the gas share of the market rises and, um, and above what their initial forecasts would show. And, uh, and so the numbers stay pretty flat year over year. Um, and that's certainly been the case this year. At the start of 2023, uh, gas demand forecasts called for, again, about a 2% decline in consumption. And in fact, it's up a point. Um, and it's all due to the fact that there's been more gas burned on the power side than had been expected. And it's not just due to the fact that it's been hot as blazes in Texas, it's really a function of the fact that more coal-fired power plants got retired than, uh, and, and because of that, natural gas um, uh, maintained its share of marketplace um, rather, than, uh, in, rather than losing it to uh, solar and wind. So less coal use um, has, been, has rebounded to um, natural gas's uh, favor. Now, you can't play that game forever at some point, right? You shut down every single coal fire power plant. And, uh, and so then uh, gas will be stuck with uh, increased competition from solar and wind. Um, but that, we think, won't be the case in 2024 anyway. And so my guess would be that, again, we get to, uh, you know, through next year and we'll look back and be able to say that gas consumption in the U.S. stayed fairly flat year over year. So... Um, the growth then in the marketplace on gas has always been, for the last several years, has been in terms of uh, gas exports, in particular LNG exports. So, um, and here's where the story, you know, is pretty bright. Um, so, uh, gas exports now are approaching 20% of the gas market in the U.S. So, if you look at all the gas we produce, uh, about 80% of it goes to the use of domestic consumers, and about 20% of it is uh, shipped abroad. Um, to foreign markets and a big chunk of that now, the bigger part of those exports are now uh, LNG exports. And those are up, um, forecast to be up 12% this year and another 12% next year. So uh, solid double digit kind of growth rates in um, the LNG market. Part of that is 
uh, this year is due to the fact that the Freeport LNG uh, terminal is back in action and uh, so replacing some of those lost cargoes from last year and uh, the full year effects of that recovery from Freeport won't be affected until uh, 2024. So we're seeing this kind of growth in, um, in output even though there's really no new LNG terminals coming on stream until the latter parts of 2024 or maybe the early parts of 2025 at this point. So this isn't a function of the capacity to export growing. It's just a recovery in that, um, in that situation around uh, Freeport that is um, making a difference. So I should point out that at, during this summer anyway, uh, the price of uh, US LNG has been in the range of seven to seven and a half dollars per million BTU. So um, last year, following the invasion in uh, Ukraine, uh, you know, we saw uh, uh, our LNG export prices in the 14 to 16 dollar range, as I recall. So we're about half that level uh, of a year ago, but very close to the level that we enjoyed back in 2021. So I think as the natural, the LNG market on the global basis sort of normalizes, um, we can expect to see this kind of a seven to eight dollar price for uh, LNG from the U.S. Uh, being realized in the marketplace, which is uh, then I think key when it comes to thinking about where gas prices at the wellhead are headed here in the U.S. So, but before we get to that discussion, let's take a peek at U.S. gas production numbers. And again, um, they look pretty flat going forward. Um, 103 BCF a day in 2023 and 103.1 BCF a day next year. Again, these are our numbers, not from the EIA, because we're linking them to our estimates of wells drilled and well productivity. Um, and on the gas side anyway, for new shale gas wells, the data that we have anyway would indicate that shale gas well productivity, these new shale gas wells, uh, the productivity actually was down on the order of about 10% last year. Now there's been a bit of a recovery in 2023, but again, just to the point about um, you know, the acreage that's available and the prospectivity of said acreage and, uh, and what that means in terms of um, going forward and what we might expect. So again, what we see when we look at data that we have available on the drilling side, uh, you know, lateral links have largely stabilized after having grown, um, you know, year over year basis for several years. Um, but last year, this year, uh, lateral links have, have, have not changed very much. And so we're not getting that boost in productivity that comes from, you know, an extra thousand feet of lateral um, that was often the case in the past. And, uh, and so, again, uh, going forward, we have left gas well productivity pretty flat through, our, through 2028, uh, you know, the, the last year in our current forecast. Um, because again, uh, what we hear, you know, tier one acreage, there's four-ish, five-ish years left of that to be drilled. And we think that'll be, continue to be the dominant form of, um, of activity going forward. And uh, so we're pretty comfortable with the notion that productivity stays fairly flat. But again, I, uh, I would, I would uh, it'd be a healthy discussion around the issue of does productivity rise from where it stands today? Because I think there's um, lots of reasons to expect that it would be really struggled to do that. There's always those folks on the completion side that can work their magic and improve output. And um, certainly that uh, there's many who are working to that point. But uh, again, when you look at the U.S. as a whole, um, it becomes a slightly different discussion around uh, the trends in that, on that particular point. So again, with uh, U.S. LNG prices in this seven to seven and a half dollar range, we think going forward, um, as the market normalizes, then I think we get um, a bit of an uptick in the wellhead price. Um, uh, at least relative to what we've seen this year. So um, this year's number now look like uh, spot gas prices at the Henry Hub are going to average somewhere in this $2.60 range. Um, but next year uh, go up pretty substantially to around the $3.5 number for uh, 2024. Um, the um, you know the, the the biggest part reason that uh, uh, gas prices have been so weak this year is of course that our um, gas inventory numbers have been so high. I think uh, 
Uh, today, we're looking at somewhere around 500 billion cubic feet of gas in storage above where it was at the same time last year. And that kind of differential has been in place throughout most of, uh, most of this year. And excess gas inventories have really weighed on prices, as is often the case in any mature industry, right? Um, so, uh, and, and it will probably, by the time we get toward the end of this year, ahead of winter, we'll probably peak at somewhere around 4,000 BCF in uh, storage, which will be close to an all-time high if uh, we're on trend, or we, if we stay on trend. Um, so again, it won't be uh, until we get into winter that there's really an opportunity for gas prices to strengthen on a sustained basis. We think that'll be the case if we're right in terms of further growth in uh, export uh, numbers and if the demand picture stays uh, as we think it will. Um, and um, so, uh, and again, as, uh, as if that's the case, then wellhead prices we think in the U.S. will rally somewhat um, in, uh, to sort of close the gap between uh, the wellhead price and the LNG export price. It won't be you know, it won't go up to that LNG export price. But I think it's um, informative to look back at 2021. So 2021 was a year when, um, you know, gas demand in the U.S. was uh, growing because we were coming out of the pandemic. Um, LNG export prices were in this 7 to $8 range for much of the year. Um, wellhead gas prices were, I think, 379 380 back in 2021. So I think that kind of ratio between uh, a wellhead, an, an export price and a wellhead price that uh, where the wellhead price is uh, somewhere around 50% of the export price uh, seems to be where the U.S. market will end up um, stabilizing. So that's been that's guided our estimate of of, of uh, pro gas prices uh, going forward. Anyway, is that we'll see this uh, this kind of thing um, uh, reemerge, this kind of ratio. Uh, between export and uh, wellhead prices um, you know, become a, a feature of the marketplace here in the U.S. Once we get past 2024, uh, we've got more U.S. Uh, LNG uh, uh, export capacity coming online, but there'll be more uh, export capacity from other places as well. So the LNG, the global market, on a global basis, the LNG market, I think, is going to be pretty well supplied. And so we don't see a bunch of a push on pricing like we might have um, expected in the past. Putting all that together then, what does it mean in terms of cash flow from operations? So this is uh, an exercise we go through each quarter looking at the publicly traded companies and what they report in terms of their cash flow CFO um, from operations. And as you can see, uh, it has come down mightily from what it was uh, just a year ago. Um, uh, the Q3 and Q4 numbers for 2023 reflect those uh, that 80-ish dollar price for oil and that uh, sub three dollar price for gas that we're assuming. Um, but what it means is that cash flow from operations this year for this group of companies is going to end up around 95, 96 billion dollars uh, versus 140-ish billion dollars last year. So down 45 billion dollars from a year ago. Pretty substantial decrease. Uh, which colors some of the ratios that we uh, end up taking uh, using those numbers. Here's that same group of companies and what their capital spending has been uh, over, since the, tw the start of 2021. And so we have, we have actual numbers through uh, Q2 of this year and, and the last two quarters of 2023 are, are, are our forecast uh, of that, those companies' capital spending numbers. And as you can see, they're down just slightly. Um, but they've stayed pretty steady. They've been in the 16 to 18 billion dollar a quarter range um, here for much of the past uh, a year, and we think that will continue to be the case in 20 uh, through the balance of this year. Uh, again, we look at this group of companies. The rig count from those has stayed fairly steady, uh, so that would tell us that there's a certain amount of stability in their spend figures. Uh, uh, we just have to uh, estimate what uh, what benefits are getting from lower service pricing, uh, which has been a bit of a case. We'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, so one of the things then you take those ratios, you take that ratio between uh, capital spending and divide it by cash flow from operations to get a reinvestment rate, which is what this chart shows. And what you see, of course, is a tremendous jump over the past year. We're up to a, a um, reinvestment ratio of almost 80%. But uh, And while that ratio is basically double what it was um, 
four quarters ago, um, when it was about 40%, the reason it's jumped so much is that cash flow from operations, the denominator has fallen in half. So, uh, so the spending figure hasn't changed very much. The ratio has jumped tremendously just because cash flow from operations has been. I don't think this tells me anything about what the future uh, reinvestment ratios are because my guess will be that they'll come back down as cash flow recovers if we're right about where commodity prices are headed. So I see the CapEx spend figures being pretty sticky um, and this reinvestment ratio beginning to turn down uh, in 2024 um, based on where we uh, estimate cash flow from operations to be. So, and then the other bit, of course, everybody's fascinated by is what, uh, what are these same companies doing with regard to debt and shareholder repayments? And here's what that number looks like. So again, as a CFO has fallen uh, in the first half of this year, the amount of money being uh, returned to shareholders and, and used to pay off uh, debt holders has fallen a, a lot. In fact, in the second quarter of 2023, if the numbers we have are uh, correct, uh, it basically was a net zero. So, um, so again, um, the the, um, the intent I think on the part of operators is to uh, maintain profitability and return money to shareholders, and I think that'll be the case going forward. So, as as uh, cash flow uh, builds back up, I think these uh, numbers will recover, and it'll be the capex side of things that stays fairly sticky. Um, for the publicly traded companies that we're looking at here. So, um, so what does this all mean then when we look at uh, rig activity? Well, here's our numbers um, on a quarterly basis uh, going forward. If you add them all up uh, year over year, we end up with 697 active rigs in 2023. That's down about 3% from the 720 rigs that we averaged last year. And our number for 2024 is 674, which is down another 3% on a year over year basis. You know, today we stand at 650 or just below that in terms of rig count. So these numbers would suggest that we began to rally uh, from this point forward as, um, as oil prices and gas prices began to recover uh, or continue to recover. Um, but, um, uh, but uh, it, Frankly, when we look at our models, um, they're becoming less and less price sensitive. So if you look at measures of rig activity or wells drilled or anything like that, um, you know, the ratio between activity and the relationship, I should say, between activity and um, commodity prices, it just becomes less and less important over time, um, which is, I th think, true for the market as a whole. Um, when we think about individual operators, uh, it seems that useful to me to think of sort of two groups. There are those publicly traded companies, um, you know, representative of the slides we just um, showed you, um, that collectively these days account for 40 to 45 percent of the rigs out there. Um, and I think that group is, uh, doesn't, you know, chase activity uh, or activ their, their activity doesn't chase commodity prices like it was back in the bad old um, pre-capital discipline days, right? So you have a significant chunk of the market that looks pretty steady state year to year, quarter to quarter in terms of what their spending plans and activity levels are and really aren't um, at all keyed to, uh, to commodity price changes because they're taking those extra dollars and instead of drilling, they're returning to shareholders. Um, there is a group, um, which are the smaller companies um, and privately held firms, uh, which I think are more responsive to, um, to changes in commodity prices. They were certainly the case last year when prices went up so much and you know, we saw rig activity uh, rise. But this year, as commodity prices have underperformed expectations, those very same companies have uh, largely been the ones who have been uh, you know, returning the rigs to the yard and, uh, and uh, and cutting back on their uh, expenditures. So, so we have sort of a, a, a two-phase group that we have to think about um, in terms of the U.S. oil patch going forward. And I think collectively what, that, um, what I'm comfortable with is thinking that the bigger guys will stay fairly steady, the smaller guys will do some, there'll be some response to um, improving commodity prices. And so if we just look at things on an exit to exit basis going from Q4 of 23 to Q4 of 22, 24, um, that we're looking at a four to maybe five percent improvement in rig activity uh, collectively over that kind of time span. Um, 
one of the re I'm I'm a little bit skeptical. We have a bit of an increase from where we stand today, anyway, in the fourth quarter of this year, and I'm a little bit skeptical that that might happen. There may be some operators though who uh, look at where oil prices are today and where the cost of drilling and completing wells is today, and decide that they want to take advantage of some lower rates and begin to lock them in um, and by signing contracts and beginning to put some rigs to work. So I think perhaps that school of thought may be behind uh, any increase we see in the fourth quarter of this year in terms of rig activity. Our models would suggest that will happen. Um, and uh, so that's what, we've, um, what we're showing here. But it's, um, but I think it's, um, again, not so much chasing prices, but rather taking advantage of what are fairly low service costs. Um, we've seen service costs come down uh, about 5% since the first of the year based on the surveys we do. It's interesting, uh, lower pipe prices account for 55 to 60% of that uh, uh, total decline. Uh, lower stimulation prices are another 25 to 30% of it. So those two categories uh, represent uh, um, you know, a high percentage, 85 to 90% of the aggregate decrease, uh, the aggregate decline in prices uh, so far. So there's you know, been some notable areas. It hasn't spread too much yet to the, um, to the rig rate fi uh, figures, at least as far as our numbers would suggest, although I think that's um, debatable. But uh, rig rates at least got reported by the publicly traded um, drilling contractors were pretty steady from Q1 uh, and Q2. So, um, so uh, but again, the environment's uh, softer than the price environment on the service side, a little bit softer than what it was. And I think there may be some operators who want to take advantage of uh, that and put some rigs to work. So. The issue longer term will be, again, this discussion around will operators step up their uh, drilling and completion activity in order to offset any decline that they face on the productivity side of things. Uh, and that's an open discussion because that's a brave new world for all of us here uh, in the oil patch. We've not really dealt with that before. And, um, and so it remains to be seen because there are, I think, strong arguments to be made that it, it might happen and that activity does rise. Um, but there are also arguments to be made that it won't happen. Um, one of the things we saw, if you go way, way back in the 50s and 60s, was that activity, well, the commodity prices were very flat. Of course, they were $3 oil at the time. But um, because the Mideast was coming on with more and more barrels each year, the price of oil stayed pretty flat. Um, and so operators just left activity decline um, year over year. So we saw a fairly steady decrease in, in that kind of an environment. I think what we're looking at now is that um, there's not a lot of spare capacity in the world and so we might expect that instead of flat commodity prices that in fact they'll rise and so does rising a commodity price uh, encourage operators who are facing a lower well productivity to uh, to spend more in order to do that and their reinvestment ratio may stay fairly constant in that kind of an environment but it does depend upon higher activity does depend upon a rising commodity price and that'll be i think a key thing for all of us to uh, be alert to. From a frack activity, you're looking at those folks who are more keyed to the completion side. Um, frack activity we think will be fairly flat year over year. Um, 12,700 jobs this year, 12,800 frack jobs next year according to our lights. Uh, if you're more tracking what the spread counts are, um, you know, today we're looking at 260-ish or so uh, frack spreads. It's going to average around 265 for the year, I believe. And we think that that's the kind of number we're going to see in terms of frac spreads, active frac spreads next year as well. So um, with productivity of frac spreads in terms of completions per month or completions per quarter has actually been pretty flat. So I know there's been some discussion about more uh, increased productivity on the, uh, among frac spreads, and I'm sure that's the case uh, in individual instances. But across the U.S. as, as a whole, as best we can tell, um, there's not been much of a gain in terms of frack spread count. So I don't think we can count on uh, fewer frack spreads to get the same amount of work done. I think we're, uh, I think we're pretty static there from a uh, productivity standpoint from the frack service guys. Um, Canada is, again, um, an, an interesting market. This year, uh, I think we'll see uh, activity up about 3%. Um, so again, the seasonality of the Canadian market has uh, somewhat saved them when you look at year-over-year -year change uh, because they had a very strong first quarter. Their first quarter numbers uh, 
recount were 15% higher than the first quarter of 2022. Uh, second quarter was about even with uh, 2022. The third quarter this year will be about 5% less than the third quarter of last year. So, so relative to a year ago, um, uh, Canadian activity is, uh, is, is, is weakening. Um, but when you put together the numbers on a year-over-year -year basis, there'll be a slight increase. Um, we think uh, around 3%. So 175 rigs, 6,200 wells, and 64 million feet of hole, that kind of thing. Um, the numbers for next year would suggest, again, given the uh, estimates we've made around oil and gas prices, that activity um, will stay pretty flat year-over-year. -year. So we see about the same kind of numbers in terms of rigs and wells and footage. Uh, in 2024 as what we've uh, seen this year. Now, uh, what's uh, interesting and got folks uh, north of the border excited is that um, there are uh, not one, not two, but three LNG export terminals that are making progress and are at this point anyway slated to come online sometime in the 2025 to 2027 timeframe. So Shell has its Canada LNG project there's a wood fiber LNG project, um, and then there's one that is a floating LNG project, uh, uh, Cedar Point Cedar uh, Cedar LNG, um, which uh, and and again they're all making progress. And so, as those uh, come online, I think it will do for the Canadian uh, industry what uh, what LNG terminals and LNG export capacity has done for the U.S. market. Maybe not proportionally um, the, the same, but, uh, but it will certainly underpin uh, this expectation that you'll need increased, uh, at least gas-related drilling in order to support those volumes. So, um, so that's a little bit outside uh, the focus that most folks have, which is just through the end of 2024. But we have begun to see a touch more uh, gas-related drilling in the rig numbers than was the case in the past. And so you know, you're beginning to see a little bit of that kind of a shift in the marketplace away from gas and toward, uh, away from oil and toward gas within the Canadian uh, rig numbers. Internationally, uh, rig count has been growing pretty steadily. If you look at the year over year, year numbers since it bottomed in the early days of 2021, the annual rate of growth has been around 12%. And uh, this uh, looks, this is kind of the same case for 2023 as a whole. Although, as you can see from this chart, the regional numbers, uh, you know, uh, are quite different. Um, and we see, but we see only about an 8% growth in the aggregate international rig count numbers next year. Um, so we think it's poised to slow down a little bit. Um, if you know, you look at the individual bars on the chart, uh, Europe was the one that fell last year, but has grown so much this year. And it's uh, only because uh, last year's numbers, um, we lost uh, the Ukrainian uh, rig count, uh, uh, rig activity for a large part of 2022, but it's come on back in 2023. So that accounts for the swing in, in Europe. It's not that operators there are suddenly spending a lot more money or reinvesting on a lot higher ratio. It's just a function of this um, uh, Ukrainian uh, rig count uh, situation. Um, elsewhere, though, you can see that the pace of activity is clearly slowed in most other regions from 2022 to 2023, and that's what we think will continue on down in 2024. So when we look out on a quarterly basis, um, you know, we're sitting here today with a rig count number that's a little bit over 900. We think that by the end of next year, we'll begin to approach 1,000 rigs. Um, we're going to average 914 rigs or so this year is our forecast, and 984 uh, next year. So uh, we do grow, and this is both land and offshore rigs in markets outside of North America, excluding Russia, China, and the Central Asia markets where we just don't have uh, rig count numbers available to us. Offshore, uh, if you just look at the offshore piece, uh, we do have that uh, increasing as well, up about 11% this year and up on the order of about 8% next year. Um, a bit of a cap, uh, I think, will affect uh, in terms of just offshore rig availability is uh, what's being faced here. So uh, there's a pretty high utilization rate for drill ships, uh, increased utilization rate for jackups. And so that caps uh, how much more of an increase, um, or it certainly limits how much more of an increase we might see on the offshore rig count side of things um, around the world. And so we're trying to take that into account when we put these numbers together. So uh, it's a strong market and it's an increasing market but um, but I think there we're beginning to bump up 
again, some of the limits of uh, capacity to drill offshore um, that uh, you know, has not been a factor for quite some time uh, in this particular sector. So uh, certainly rig rates, offshore rig rates have uh, skyrocketed in recent quarters and uh, we think they'll continue to be pretty strong going forward. And when we break the numbers down on a regional basis, again, you've got about an 8% growth in South America this year, around 5% next year. It's pretty exciting uh, when you look at individual countries, of course, um, uh, you know, Petrobras is a well-known story there. Their, um, their pre-salt uh, uh, wells in the Santos Basin just, just exceeded a cumulative production of a billion barrels. And uh, they expect that in four years' time, they'll, the cumulative production number will be at two billion barrels. So they've got uh, 16 different FPSOs going in, in in Brazil over the next several years. Uh, the Vaca Muerta down in Argentina is one that currently produces somewhere around 300,000 barrels of oil a day. And the there are those who think it might be able, capable of producing a million barrels of oil a day by 2030 uh, should um, a related investment for pipelines and things like that you know, line up as planned. Uh, Europe, like I said, is up uh, sharply this year, um, but we think it'll only be up about 6% next year. Um, Norway is doing its part in the North Sea. The, the authorities there just recently approved, I think, 19 different development projects. The UK, though, I recently called a conference among bankers uh, encouraging them to support um, uh, UK operators who needed to borrow money in order to develop uh, uh, their oil and gas fields. And what they found was a disappointing list of companies uh, willing to show up. Um, and it's due to uh, several different reasons. One is that the UK itself recently increased its windfall profits tax and then extended the number of years that that tax was going to be in place. Um, and then the, the banks themselves have collectively formed groups that are uh, in uh, accordance with their ESG initiatives, uh, not uh, 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 lending money to the fossil fuel sector for fossil fuel development. And then finally, it looks like the Labor Party is going to win the election. And Labor has itself said um, that it wants to uh, basically not allow any more leasing, new lease, new acreage to be leased uh, offshore the UK. So uh, you've got a bunch of issues that make it really challenging for lenders to feel real comfortable with um, with um, uh, exposing more of their money to the UK oil sector. So we just don't see a lot of exciting things happening there in the UK, sadly. Africa up about 15% all told this year, up 5% next year. Um, North Africa has been the source of most of the increase in 2023. And at least in the case of Egypt, um, it looks like there'll be um, a sustained push to for on the exploratory drilling side over the next couple of years. Several of the majors you see there, ENI, Chevron, Exxon, and Shell, and BP are all um, with programs to increase uh, gas exploration in particular. Libya has some field development projects that it's gearing up and working on through ENI. And so um, that market there is, and of course then there's Shell in Namibia who can't help but find oil with every well they drill, it appears. And so um, so we have uh, a lot of exciting stories in and around uh, different countries in Africa. Nigeria, I don't think, is going to be much of a factor, and that's been you know, the keystone for that continent for quite some time. But I think the focus of increased activity is moving away from uh, that country. Middle East up about 12% this year, and, and again, on track, we think, to go up about another 12% uh, next year. Um, we don't think of it very much associated with um, with um, the Middle East, but the Eastern Mediterranean uh, waters offshore um, Israel and Cyprus and Lebanon to some degree have been the source of uh, several big uh, gas discoveries in recent past and continue to be that way. And so we're going to hear more about field development in those areas. And then, of course, there's the big exporting nations um, which uh, in the Middle East, so Saudi and uh, Abu Dhabi, which have plans to increase their um, production capacity and, and so billions of dollars at CapEx that's poised to enter the market there. And then finally, Asia Pacific up about 10%, uh, all told this year and 5 6% growth next year. Um, so you've got any number of projects, um, Thailand, Malaysia, offshore, India, all beginning to uh, make a difference and beginning to move forward there. So uh, again, uh, each of those international markets for the first time in a while is uh, expected to grow in uh, the coming year. Um, so we have, uh, we have um, uh, 
good outlook in each of our areas and for most of the countries in each of those areas at this point. Finally, China, Russia, and Central Asia, all areas where it's kind of opaque as to figure out what is going on there and what might be happening. Certainly offshore China, uh, CNOOC, China National Offshore Oil Company, has got big plans in terms of growing its gas production in the South China Sea and plans in terms of CapEx going forward. So uh, that's a pretty um, interesting story and one that's available to a lot of Western firms who um, serve that market. Um, although it's interesting that uh, the Chinese have developed their own, for the first time, their own subsea production system and put it in place. So there is some um, domestic uh, indigenous uh, uh, growth in terms of tech oil field technology that uh, we're beginning to see in the offshore segment in China. Russia, as best we can tell, down about 5% this year. Uh, there are those who forecast that uh, relative to the 12 million barrels a day that Russia is producing today, that come 2025, it's going to be more like 10 million barrels a day due to the lack of um, capital spending going on there. Uh, the, the government's increased taxes in that sector in order to make up uh, shortfalls in its own budget. Back to that story about the fiscal break-even point. And, um, and so I think that's going to uh, be a limit on uh, Russian activity, although much of that's off limits to uh, Western firms at this point, given sanctions. And finally, Central Asia is one that hasn't changed very much year over year. We don't think it's going to change very much going forward. Um, there's a real problem in a couple of those countries. Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are facing a real drop in their uh, capacity to export gas. Part of it's due to increased domestic gas consumption. Part of it's just due to the fact that fields are playing out. And um, so the question is what to do about uh, what will China do if it's uh, suddenly lacking somewhere around 8 billion cubic meters of gas by pipeline from Central Asia. Um, Russia, of course, has volunteered to step in, but um, there's issues around rerouting pipelines and so forth that'll probably keep that from happening anytime soon. So there does exist the potential in the LNG market globally that um, China may be scrambling to buy more LNG to offset any loss that it's getting out of the Central Asia market. And that's gonna be something we have to keep an eye on both with regard to LNG prices um, but also with regard to investment in, in the Central Asian countries. So a couple, an interesting point there, uh, you know, part of the world that we don't think about very much. Anyway, that comes to the end of my prepared remarks. We do have a few questions, questions. Um, in place, one of which um, I've got a couple that have come in um, uh, ahead of time. Uh, I'll take one. Well, the first one is, of course, where's Richard? And we don't know. Uh, he's, uh, I think, recreating the trek from uh, Lewis and Clark, and so was somewhere on the uh, Oregon coast the last time we knew about him. But Richard, if you're listening, we'd be glad to have you come back. Um, more importantly, um, regarding the issue of sustainability initiatives, so we talk about CapEx directed toward drilling and completion. The question is, uh, are the sustainability initiatives that many of the um, oil companies have these days um, really reducing the capital available to drill and complete new wells. And I don't think that's the case. It's interesting when you sort of drill down into the issue of what are gas, oil and gas companies doing around the issue of sustainability and removing carbon from their operations and so forth. A lot of that, I mean, there is some use of high line rigs and so electric powered rigs, um, but much of it is really focused on the production sector. And so are replacing gas engine driven compressor packages with electric motor compressors packages and whatnot as a way of reducing CO2 emissions, although it's really fascinating. So when you an operator uses a gas engine driven compressor, those are scope one emissions, CO2 emissions. Um, if he uses an electric motor driven compressor, those are now scope three emissions and kind of outside of. Um, it's not much of a pickup in terms of lower carbon emissions when you go from a gas engine to an electric motor. And we've gone through the whole exercise of how much energy is consumed on a BTU horsepower, yeah, BTU per horsepower hour, um, hour for both electric motors and, um, and gas engines. And we've had to, I think if we've gotten the carbon intensity of the Texas electrical grid correct, um, when you go through all the calculations, switching to an electric motor only reduces carbon emissions, carbon emissions by about 20%. So there's not much of a, of a sustainability gain, right, by doing that. But what you often see is a much higher 
or a significantly higher um, uptime associated with electric motor driven compressor packages and gas engine driven. And so that really becomes the economic reason to do that. So again, I don't think it's really taking away from the CapEx dollars that that uh, available to drilling and completion because a lot of these compressor packages are being rented. But um, but there, it is out there as a form of um, as a form of uh, competition, as it were, with dollars. One of the questions that's coming is, where do you suspect the recent surge of U.S. oil production is coming from, considering the continued decline in rig count and frac spreads? Yeah, so those of you who follow the uh, EIA forecast, you see that they've, over the course of the years, been bumping up their estimate of U.S. oil production um, to the tune of about two or 300,000 barrels a day relative to what it was a few months ago. And when I go into the numbers and begin to parse it, it seems like they have chronically undercounted the amount of oil being produced from our legacy conventional oil fields. Um, whatever the model they're using seems to, um, seems to underestimate uh, what those numbers are going to be going forward. And as time goes by and actual data comes in, what you find is uh, significant that actual production from these conventional legacy oil fields is two to 300,000 barrels a day higher than what they had been initially forecasting. So it seems to me that that's, that that's been the, what's been behind the rise. It hasn't been so much that um, output from a tide oil fields is well above what their forecast. It's really these uh, this conventional oil fields, which is collectively around a million barrels a day, 1.2 maybe million barrels a day. So. Uh, it's sort of what's forgotten, and uh, and it seems like the model chronically assumes that that production number is going to go down, and that's where I think a lot of the revisions have come from. One of the other questions is, lots of talk about U.S. production climbs for new wells and talk of higher drilling completion productivity. So more wells are required, but those wells are getting less expensive to put in production. Do the two offset, or is one stronger than the other? So it's interesting because um, those well new wells are less expensive today than they were um, I don't think we can assume that necessarily going forward. Um, so, um, you know, we've over the course of this year idled already about 125 rigs, right? So there's some <laughs> spare capacity on the rig side that exists. Um, and uh, so we might see pricing come down there that we haven't seen yet. But much of the other uh, components of, uh, of going to well costs, uh, I don't think pie prices are going to set any further my guess would be they recover a little bit from where they are today frac pricing has gotten a little softer but not a lot um, so i think that and for the most part we when we talk to oil service firms they're pretty intent on trying to hold the line in terms of prices so um, so i think going forward there's a bit of a chance that we'll see softer prices my guess would be that as we look to the publicly traded companies anyway that they'll probably see um, their uh, capex budgets down um, in the five to ten percent range next year, and I get to those numbers by saying, well, activity we think will fall about three percent ish, maybe year over year, and if well costs are down um, five percent or so uh, year over year, then you get to this maybe ten percent decline in in capital spending, um, just to, and you know uh, if, if in 2024. Um, but further on, you know, then I think uh, I think we see well costs, uh, drilling and completion costs, kind of move in line with inflation, which is uh, maybe a target rate of around three percent. So, um, so I don't know that that we'll always see well costs uh, declining. Um, so it's going to be a real challenge, right? Uh, d uh, will operators be willing to to uh, see pro profitability suffer? Uh, as well productivity declines if they want to maintain production, which means paying a higher price to drill and complete wells. And um, I'm not sure that everybody's going to be willing to do that. Um, some will, um, but, uh, but others won't. And uh, so that's, I think, uh, so we'll probably get answers yes and no. <laughs> I don't think everybody's going to be a yes. I don't think everybody's going to be a no. I think there's those kind of things that folks have in question. Last one I'll think we have time for is one on carbon capture. We get a lot of questions about that, and clearly there's a segment of the market, um, the folks on the compression side, and some on the drilling side, too, are both interested in it. There are on the order of 160 projects, carbon capture projects that have been proposed just here in the U.S. Um, there are, you know, almost all of these projects are going to sequester their CO2 in an aquifer. 
there are some that are going to put the CO2 as a tertiary recovery prospect. But most of them are really talking about putting it in an aquifer someplace, which requires you to have a class six underground injection well, so UIC well. There are hundreds of uh, permits, uh, or per there have been applications for hundreds of these class six wells uh, permits to be issued. Um, there are exactly two that are in operation today. So, and the big problem is that the permitting staff required to environmental reviews and so forth is just not in place at the federal level. And um, so, so until that happens, there's just this long backlog and who knows what the lead time will be before you get um, you know, these kind of wells being drilled and thus projects that can move forward in terms of the surface facilities you need for pipelines and compression and things like that with carbon capture. So, um, so you know, in my older days uh, as a uh, young industrial engineer, I remember, remember using Gantt charts, which were, allowed you to establish a timeline for the various process as you go from A to B and get a project done. And um, that's clearly what's needed with regard to carbon capture, but there's a lot of uncertainty around what those timelines might be because uh, one of the ones that nobody knows anything about is what the court challenges might be uh, regarding and the new pipelines that need built or anything. So it's very difficult to uh, identify what the carbon capture opportunity might be. But I think it does, uh, maybe a year from now, we'll have a glimmer of more insight. That. Well, anyway, the atomic, the clock that we have in the office, which is linked to the Naval Observatory's atomic clock, tells me that my hour has gone by. And so we will uh, wrap things up here. Thank you very much for listening. We'll be back in December with an update to the forecast. If or then you have any questions, please reach out to us um, here at Spears and Associates, and we'll be happy to answer or try to answer anything you have. Until then, best of luck.